Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Star Family Wisdom Podcast. I'm Jenna Layden, founder of Star Family Wisdom and a former Global Vice President for Whole Foods Market. It's so good to be here with you today. Thank you for joining and watching. If you're on YouTube, if you're not on YouTube, jump over to YouTube so you can see us on camera. Star Family Wisdom is a paradigm-shifting podcast community and online school for your spiritual and cosmic evolution. And myself and our co-host, Sinead, Wellahan, share conversations and ideas between ourselves and with guests that can support you and hopefully inspire you on this wild journey of being human. We are both experiencers of supernatural phenomena and ET experiences, so it's important to us that we have mature, open, and fun conversations about what's possible and how humans are evolving and how our world is evolving. And in today's episode, we have a solo interview between Sinead and Eric Maisel. Dr. Eric Maisel is an incredible author of over 50 books, and his interests include creative living and creativity coaching and helping people understand life purpose and meaning. He also is very um, focused on mental health and critical psychology and helping parents parent in what some could consider a mental disorder age. And some of his work has also been featured in Psychology Today. He writes a blog for that publication and he hosts workshops around the world, coaching clients on how to live creatively during a stressful age. And he's the founder of the Life Purpose Boot Camp and a self-paced instructor training uh, for people who want to support others in finding their life purpose. So we talk a lot about life purpose at Star Family Wisdom and, and destiny and how we can connect to that that sense of meaning in our life and how we can understand our individual contribution in this world because we all have a unique contribution we can make. We all have a purpose and a mission, perhaps, that we come into our life with. And Sinead has a beautiful conversation with Dr. Eric Maisel, not only about the, the stressful things about our current age and how we can navigate that in a healthy and creative way, but also how we can find meaning and purpose in our life and in how we give back to the world around us and in how we show up you know, in the world. So this is a really lovely conversation that I hope is very supportive for you as, as I think we're all feeling the stress of the world today and, and a lot of complexity in our current culture. And, and Dr. Eric Maisel really breaks down how we can navigate that. So without further ado, we'll get into it and we'll see you on the other side. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment letting us know what resonates with you and what you liked about today's episode so we can bring you more content that is resonating. And we'll see you next time. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Star Family Wisdom. It's Sinead Willihan flying solo today and with the wonderful Dr. Eric Maisel, who insists that we call him Eric. So we can call him Eric for the remainder of this interview, or I, I'm not we. Um, so Dr. Maisel, thank you so much for being with us here today, Eric. And we really, really appreciate you, just your presence you know, today and the, all the knowledge and wisdom you're going to share with our audience, which is substantial. So I'm really, really excited about this conversation with you. I've been looking forward to it for a while. Yeah, it's lovely to be with you. Thank you. So what I thought we could do, because we've given a full introduction about you, your work, uh, the many years you spent in psychiatry, and your special focuses on youth and parents, for example, mental health, reframing how mental health is, is approached. But the main thing I want to start with is um, the incredible way, to me, that you branch the very left brain and the very right brain aspects of humanity with your work. And so you bring together the left brain and right brain in your current work with your background as a family therapist and as somebody who has delved very deeply into creativity as a, as a force, as a tool for us to use to create a better life essentially for ourselves. But you bring in the psychological aspect of it as well. It seems like you have a very balanced approach to do it, to, to wellness, right? To how you're approaching new ways 
of um, thinking about wellness, new ways of communicating about it, new ways of addressing mental health challenges, however they show up for the individual, for young people, for parents. So could you talk about how, how you stumbled upon creativity as a powerful tool in your work with people? Uh, let me start from a slightly oblique place or slightly different place. Um, one of the things that interests me the most is the paradigm shift from the idea of life having a purpose to the idea of each of us having multiple life purpose choices. That there isn't a purpose to life, in my opinion, but rather those things that are important to each of us, which become our life purpose choices. When a person gets that shift in mind, then they stop seeking, stop hunting for something and realize that they have to decide what's important to them and then get those important things on their daily to-do list rather than being led around by the nose by our errands and responsibilities and what have you. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if we could actually get to our important things each day, comma, and so for me, creativity is just, in quotes, just one of our life purpose choices. It's not the only thing that's important in life, but it's one of the things that's important in life. Mm -hmm. And we can make a pretty kind of simple menu of those things that are typically important to human beings. Creativity, service, activism, career, family, relationships, probably aren't more than a dozen or 15 categories of things that are important to people. Mm -hmm. creativity being one of them and when we don't address one of those important things even if we're addressing two or three that are important but leaving out a few others that are important we don't feel well we're a little bit disappointed in ourselves we feel a little dreary let's say our career is doing okay but our relationship isn't but well, we're not going to feel well or vice versa if we have a good relationship but our career is hell, that's not going to feel good. So we have lots of things to attend to as human beings, really more than we can deal with. Yes. Everybody is stressed out, overwhelmed. There are more things to deal with than we can actually deal with. Agreed. But, but our job is to do the best we can and to keep in mind this idea of life purpose choices, not always be not always only be doing those low-hanging fruit to-do list things, get another thing checked off our to-do list, but actually do our service or our activism or write our novel or, or make some big changes, which often are necessary for our meaning needs. We may have to get out of our profession or get a divorce or do something that's very painful to do, but that's necessary mm -hmm. if we're going to live our life the way we intend to. So, that's a long-winded way of saying creativity to me doesn't stand alone as a thing, but rather it's one of those elements of a life, but only for those people for whom it is. Yeah, That is where there may be 95% of the world, 98% of the world don't, do not feel like they need to be creative. I don't think it's an ought or a must or a should. Agreed. I, think, I think it arises out of our needs. For me, I think people, some people are, and it's a small percentage, two, three, four, five percent, whatever it is, some people pop out of the womb stubbornly individual and already, and they look around, they look at their parents and say, who are these people and why is the world this way? And I don't think this is working right. And by three or four or five, they're already disputing and doubting. And but they may have to be silent. You can, no five-year-old can really say to their parents, guys, what's up? Why, why are you doing these goofy things? <laughs> No, no five-year-old can say that, but, mm -hmm. but kids are already, certain kids are already thinking that. They're already going their own way. They're already little mini resistance fighters, sort of resisting common humbug around them. So for mm -hmm. those people, creativity is going to be necessary because that's the way they get to express their opinions, take a stand, be a leader. All of that's going to be important to them. 
Agreed. And I love how you talk about children. I mean, I think that that's something we're going to discuss in this in this uh, episode as well with you. But as a public school teacher myself, you know, I really, really, really value the perspective of children. They have so much to offer us. And I'm not sure how well respected that is. You know, they're normally seen as being unformed, you know, not fully formed yet. And so their ideas and feelings may not be real in the eyes of adults around them. And I think that we kind of you know, devalue children a bit in that way. They have a great deal of sensitivity, insight, observation skills that, you know, we can benefit from. And you work with youth and their parents. So maybe we'll hold on to that for a minute. I want to just go back to creativity for a second here. So do you believe, in response to what you said, do you believe that everybody is inherently creative and that, you know, it just shows up in different ways? Or do you think that we have to deliberately, consciously choose to be creative? It, it's a it's a touchy subject because um, the knee jerk response is to say yes everybody's creative but um, I'm not sure I believe that mm. um, just as intelligence this is another touchy subject just as intelligence flows over a normal curve some people are more intelligent than other people we're not supposed to say that but that's the case. Newton and Einstein are smarter than you and me. That's just, just about nature and brain cells and what have you. It's not a, not a moral matter. It's just a sort of nature matter. Mm -hmm. So if you're born more sensitive, smarter, this, that, and the other thing, then you're naturally going to be creative. And if you aren't, you may not be naturally creative. Okay. Now, there were interesting studies done during the Roosevelt area, during the WPA, during the Depression, when Roosevelt decided to throw money at all kinds of interesting projects that we've never seen again, never seen since. Huh. And one was to do the following simple thing, to take two classrooms and enrich one classroom, give them more books, give them more stuff, and then do IQ tests before and after. Now, of course, we disparage IQ tests now, so I'm not saying anything about the validity of IQ tests. This is just something that was interesting that was done back then. And the enriched classrooms increased, the kids in the enriched classrooms were, had their IQ scores increased by 10 full points by enrichment. That's a huge, that's 10 or 15% increase mm. in IQ score. So that does mean that learning matters, school matters, resources matter. We can elevate folks, we can elevate kids from where they are to where they might be able to get to by helping them. Are there limits to that? Probably. Probably you can move a 100 IQ kid to 115. That's great. But you can't move them to 175. Mm -hmm. Can't have them do theoretical physics. Can't do that. So there are limitations to what, to, for each of us, in one of my books, I call it a smart gap. That is the distance we are from where we think, where we need to be to do the kind of work we want to, to do. So in a way we have to choose work that matches what we can do. Mm -hmm. Just to say that differently, you and I probably can't be theoretical physicists because the level of abstraction there is really bizarrely difficult. Uh, but we can do lots of things. <laughs> we can do lots of things where we are. So part of understanding how to live our life purposes and what to create is understanding who we are and what we can do by trial and error, by actually trying something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not sure you know, where we've landed exactly, but that's all by way of saying, in shorthand, no, I'm not sure that everybody is truly and really creative. Thank you. That's a great answer. I mean, there are lots of, I, I understand why you said that it's a, it's a sticky subject, because there are lots of different philosophies on that. I mean, there are people who say that creative creativity and destruction go hand in hand, and all of us are inherently creative and inherently destructive. But I agree with you that it does have to do with what we have to work with within our minds, our bodies, our lives, our life situations. Yeah. I just, I was just, um, interviewed by somebody who wanted my thoughts on are human being curious, which is similar, similar question. Mm -hmm. Do human beings have curiosity? And my response there too is 95% of human beings do not have curiosity. They're incurious. Wow. And I, I know this firsthand by having, I have you know, several different degrees 
And sitting in classrooms, I would be the only one raising my hand saying, why'd you say that? And is that right? And nobody else seemed to care, seemed to be curious. The only question ever asked in the classes I took was, will that be on the test? Right. Or how much homework is there? Yeah. How much homework is there? But not, and not, then no one seemed to be listening really or thinking about the question, including when it was their major. Let's say they were a psychology major and we were in a theories of personality class. And the teacher might say, you know, Freud starts with this idea that we, that we start from ground zero and develop. And Jung starts from a very different place that we are whole to begin with and undeveloped. Isn't that interesting? And nobody would have a question. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty discouraging to witness things like that. And I was mentioning to you that, you know, I was a public school teacher for 15 years. I, I still call myself a teacher because I still feel like someone who wants to have a bit of that role in life. But I can't work within the school system anymore. It is too much. It's too adverse to my own ethics and my own sense of where we need to be going with learning. And one of the things that was very discouraging um, was the lack of curiosity. Not that kids, kids are inherently curious, but I've taught both elementary school and high school. And so referencing what you're talking about, it seems as if we're kind of taught to become less curious as we go through life, right? That is certainly concerning. And what is your take on that? Why do you think that that occurs? Well, that's a, a big question, isn't it? Well, it is. We, 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 we do lose our imagination over time. Not, not By we, I mean those people who do lose it. We don't all lose it. But most people, uh, most people lose their imagination because of home and school and culture. School says draw within the lines and learn the facts for the test. Now it says other things also, but, but primarily it says draw within the lines and learn the facts for the test. And so if, if you're trying to get ahead in life and in school or just trying to get by, then that's what you need to know. You don't want to, you, you should actively discard stuff that isn't for the test. And therefore you get less and less curious and more and more functional, yes. just, just function. In the household, most, this is a non-statistic because it's kind of made up, but people who write in this field say that maybe 25% of human beings are authoritarian by nature, which means that most kids have an authoritarian mother or father or somebody in the family. If you're living in an authoritarian family, then you're living in a family where, you're, where the demand is on you to not be curious, to be quiet, to follow the rules, to know the rules, to follow the rules, etc. So that helps kill off curiosity. Mm. And then many cultures, especially to my mind, orthodox cultures, um, demand a lack of imagination. Um, you're supposed to follow God's rules or the rabbi's rules or the priest's rules or the pope's rules or somebody's rules, somebody's ideas about who you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to live, mm -hmm. that doesn't foster imagination. So we could name the five or 10 or 15 reasons why people become less and less curious or more and more incurious over time. Whatever all those reasons are, the end result is it's not a very curious species. And the folks who make progress happen are that small fraction of, you know, inventors and writers and artists and this, that small percentage, those two or three or 4%, if that much of the human race who keep wondering, wow, you know, could this be done differently or et cetera. That's right. a small percentage. And, and, and that's why I've done a, a book called Why Smart People Hurt and a new book coming out called Why Smart Teens Hurt. Because I want smart people, those people who lead us, to understand the obstacles they're up against thrown at them by the culture. In most repressive cultures, the dictators will kill the smart people first. Mm. Journalists, for example. And even if those smart people are really, really needed, like the doctors. They'll kill the doctors first because the doctors are among those smart people who will see through their repressive activities and will speak up. So 
those people who are in a position to lead not only have difficulties in making the work, it's not easy to write a symphony or, or a novel or invent, none of that's easy. And then in addition to the hardness of the work itself, the culture does not support, the culture is antagonistic to smartness, create, to, real, to real creativity. Yes. It, it does just fine with lip service creativity, with something that has great production values. It loves, someone once said, uh, Walt Disney is the most dangerous man in America, meaning that we get seduced by production values and hero's tale tales and stuff. We get seduced by beautifully made stuff as if that were actual art or creativity. And beautifully made stuff is beautiful and seductive and our grandkids can sing you every song from all those movies and they love it. But that's antagonistic to us making real progress. I love the way you're expressing this. And I really, really could not agree more. I mean, I think what you're talking about in terms of creativity and imagine, imagination um, and how those become depleted over lifetimes in order for us to become more functional and to color within the lines as adults and to, you know, help the system that is really, yep. you know, supposed to be kind of more important than us in order for everything to keep flowing smoothly for us, as if it's flowing smoothly to begin with, because it certainly isn't, especially these days. Um, you know, it, it, that is a very, I just really love the way you express that, because that's what I saw as a public school teacher. It is a big part of the reason why I had to leave the system, because I saw the stifling of imagination, the stifling of curiosity, and that is so incredibly damaging to the human, uh, to human progress, human evolution, human thought, ideas, all the things that are inherently benefit to us because we're losing our sense of ourselves. So let's bring it back to, um, to creativity a little bit more. Do you think, I mean, I completely agree that there is a very small number of people that are pushing the boundaries of uh, thought ideas, you know, questioning things, re rebelling, so to speak. Um, for example, Ai Weiwei, who is the Chinese artist, he's, he's definitely a rebel. Yep. But it is a very small population. And a common phrase we've seen in many different ways through our history and literature is that the people who are the troublemakers tend to be the ones who are um, helping us to push our culture or push our society forward but at the time that they are seen as troublemakers when they are bringing up these ideas that they have or these questions they have to try to make us think a little bit more deeply about how we're operating they are oppressed as you were just mentioning right there's a great deal of force that comes back at them when they're trying to do this so yeah. that to me is a sort of inherent create and destroy dynamic right that is is happening all within one circumstance or one context let's say there's an artist or a philosopher who is really questioning the norm and is seen as being a troublemaker as a result of that. And of course, the powers that be come back against this person. That is a natural state that seems to be occurring over and over and over again in, in you know, myriad ways, including inside of us individually. We have these sort of inner struggles with what we want to create for ourselves and what we feel we have to destroy, what we feel we have to create, what we want to destroy. So is there a way that you can articulate that sort of bigger picture of what you were just framing for the audience just now and how that occurs within the individual? So I'm kind of bringing it back to your work as a therapist and also all your research and knowledge of creativity and how that helps us. How can that battle occur in the human being? And what, what is your research? What has your research told you? All the books that you've written, all the talks that you've given about how that happens for people. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I agree with the model, so I'll have to go sideways. I'm not sure that creative people themselves are in this kind of push-pull battle inside. Okay. I think the battle is between them and the world, not between them and themselves. It's not that they don't have many internal conflicts, but I wouldn't characterize the conflicts as between creating and destroying. Okay. I would frame the many conflicts differently. One conflict is between leading and hiding because it's not safe to be seen in the world. Mm -hmm. So Freud said that all creative blockage was self-censorship. And while that's not true, it's not, not that all creative blockage is, a large percentage is the individual being unwilling 
to speak his or her truth, even to himself or herself. That's why, as I'm sure you know, public speaking is the world's number one phobia, more than flying or spiders or bridges or snakes or anything. Just getting up and speaking for two minutes scares people. Mm -hmm. So there is that conflict for performers, obviously plays itself out as performance anxiety, but there's that conflict between wanting to, desperately wanting to speak and being afraid to speak and rightly being afraid to speak for exactly the reasons we've been saying. That is, yes. if you speak, you will get criticism, pushback, rejection, silence, a million things that you don't want, that don't feel good. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, so I think that it's an act of courage to create. It's not an act of courage to create a Walt Disney movie. That is, it's not an act of courage to create something that's conventional and wanted, but it's an act of courage to create something that let's say is a little dangerous or a little unusual or a little unique. So who do you find inspiring in that way? Like when you're, when you're speaking of this particular approach, who comes to mind for you as an example or what, who or what? There are, there are many in the existential tradition who have spoken their minds. I think of Camus and Sartre and, and Kafka and Orwell, that is writers in, in the existential tradition. But many, many, just to give a simple example, um, when Tchaikovsky composed the his violin concerto, his one and only violin concerto, he knew that it was going to be panned because he knew that there was no violinist out there who could quite perform it well enough. So it was performed, it was booed off the stage. It was, a, it was pronounced the worst violin concerto ever written in human history. Oh my goodness. And, now, it, and, now, it's, and now it's the centerpiece of violin literature. So wow. you have to be able to withstand what you kind of know is coming. Many artists don't know it's coming till they first get hit in the face with it. The first time around, they may not know it's coming. But after the first time, you begin to know that if you're if you're Bob Dylan and you're going to go rock and roll, your fans may not be happy. <laughs> or, or 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 if you're a Beatle and you want to go solo, your fans are not going to be whatever whatever it is that you want to do. If it's not what the world wants you, to, oh, here's the best example of this. <laughs> Love this one. So Arthur Conan Doyle, you will not know, wrote lots of novels in addition to Sherlock Holmes because no one knows his novels. Mm -hmm. And he hated that, that everybody knew him only for Sherlock Holmes. So what did he do? You may remember he killed Sherlock Holmes. In a story, Sherlock Holmes is pushed off the, off the edge of a mountain and dies. His fans, his fans and everybody else were so outraged that Doyle could do nothing but say, oh, my mistake and brought him back in the next episode. It turns out that Holmes had hung on by his fingertips and had not really died. <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle was, did not have permission to kill Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, there are so many kinds of examples of the way in which the world makes its demands on artists, thinkers. Dare to say the earth is round. Yes, when oh my goodness. The world is, dare to say it. Yeah, that whole conversation has come back, hasn't it? The flat earth hole, round earth. I mean, we are living in such an odd time when it comes to information. You know, it seems like we're on the precipice of, uh, old information and very new uh, information, not only in content, but in delivery as well. You know, all the usual ways that we're used to receiving information are changing, including the kind of books that are being published. And yep. so I want to mention your books because I see, I know you've been writing for a while and, you know, authoring books is not new to you, but what is new that I'm seeing anyway in my limited experience in the spiritual world, because I've only really been in the spiritual community for, for four or five years, have been a spiritual practitioner for a long time, but then you get into the community, you start seeing patterns, and there's some, some really fascinating material that is being published now that never would have been published even 10 years ago. 
you know, there are amazing conversations that are had openly now that we would not have been able to have 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because of public shame, stigma, whatever. So it seems like we're living in this time where a lot of different things are shifting and changing our perspective on reality, what we think reality is, our perspective on life, our perspective on economy, our perspective on just so many things and on what information is and on on uh, what kind of information is coming at us. So you and I touched on before we started this interview today, how we're living in some something of a pivotal time, it seems, right? And of course, this could have been said many, many, many times before, but we really do seem to be living in, I guess, yet another pivotal time where there's some really fundamental pillars in our society that are uh, becoming eroded or changing place or being knocked down entirely. And your way of thinking about how to live in a, in a, I don't know how you phrase it exactly, but in a healthier, more holistic way, I see that as being right along with this new trend in what kind of information is coming at us and also how people are wanting different kinds of information. They want to live differently. They want to think differently. So I'm curious how you feel like your work um, is sort of meshing with this particular time that we're living in, because I see it as being incredibly helpful. I think your approach is extremely valuable and I want people to, to hear this from you because there are so many tools available to us during this very stressful overworked time that we can use to bring back our sense of balance or holistic wellness in our lives. And I think that the work you're doing is part of it. So what, what is your take on this pivotal time we're living in and how people can keep themselves calm and centered during this time? Well, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, Camus ends his novel, The Plague, which is an allegory about World War II, with a phrase that something like, the rats always return for the edification of mankind, meaning bad things keep happening because a large percentage of the species is not okay. And mm -hmm. it would be lovely if that were different, but it's not. So we're going to have to keep dealing with oppression and repression and authoritarians and people who want to punish and people who hate till the end of time. We're gonna have to deal with that. So the more things change, the more, the more they remain the same in that sense. And so the task for the individual has always been the same. The pre-Socratics 3000 years ago wrote about these things well, better than we write about it in many ways. And that is we have to don the mantle of personal responsibility. All we can do is what we can do. We have to have a very mature understanding of what's in our power to do and what we intend to get out of life, what our intentions are. And I think our intention, our main intention is to make ourselves proud by our efforts, not to be happy, but to do those things that we think are the, so to speak, righteous things to do, the right things to do. I have a very simple life purpose statement for myself, which is do the next right thing. Mm. And I think that's always been true. Once you circle around to essentials, it's all you can do is do the next right thing. That's all you can do. Now, what right means for any given individual is idiosyncratic and individualistic. Yes. The problem, the problem, as I was saying before, is that even if you identify what it is you think is important, it's hard to get to those things in a daily way because we have to do the, in terms, you just think in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there are things which seem to come first each day, whether it's making a living or walking the dog, or we could name a million things that are either small or large, but they get in the way of our working on our novel or being an activist in the service of a cause or what have you. They get in the way of that so that we never get to the things that are really important to us. And this, this was true from the beginning of time to the end of time is that people have trouble getting to the things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the fundamental agenda item for let's say a contemporary person who wants to live well or live an emotionally healthy life is A, to identify her life purposes, what's important, B, to actually get them onto her, her daily to-do list, not have them be future-oriented things. I'm gonna write my novel when 
school is out or when, when something happens, but I'm actually working on it now. And C, and this will open a door to a big question, C is to avoid the current mental disorder paradigm languaging. Because right now we are in a horrible mess with respect to psychiatry and what psychiatry has sold us and what Big Pharma has sold us, what the Academy has sold us, what social media has sold us, what mass media has sold us about things like depression, ADHD, ODD, OCD. I'm pausing because it, it's hard to give the whole picture in two sentences to mm -hmm. an audience that is bombarded by messages from the, so to speak, other side. But I'll just give just a tiny anecdote to, to launch into this area. In the 1950s, American Psychiatric Association created the first DSM, the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. That was the first labeling Bible. And it was an illegitimate document then. Now it's in its fifth revision. It continues to be an illegitimate document for reasons we can get into or not. And the most recent revision, which was just maybe a month ago, has stirred up some controversy, thank God, where the APA, American Psychiatric Association, has just designated prolonged grief as a mental disorder. You now get to grieve for an exact amount of time after which you're mentally disordered. Okay. If, you, if you're an adult, you get a year. At a, at a year and a day, it doesn't matter if you're, you're still grieving your husband, forget about it, mental disorder. Kids get six months, you lose both parents, after six months, forget about it, be healthy. If you're wow. still grieving, you have a mental disorder and we have, we have a chemical for that. So this is the, this is the model that's everywhere. And, and why are so many kids addicted? Well, we're giving them addictive drugs to deal with their, so to speak, ADHD and other made up mental disorders. Every feature of childhood can be construed now as a symptom of a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. So I know we've gone off into, I've gone off into a tributary here, but it's very hard to be emotionally well when we have this, what to call it, this thing that you can glom onto, this mental disorder label, and take it on if you want it and say that I have adult. I have ADD, I have this thing, and I'm gonna take a chemical for it, and I'm gonna spend the rest of my life in conflict about whether I should be taking this chemical or not, mm -hmm. and be dealing with different levels of dosages, and, be, and wondering if what's happening to me is an effect of my mental disorder or an effect of the medication or et cetera. So it's a very difficult, it's a new difficult time for tens and tens of millions of people who now have this have the availability of this mental disorder label to fall back upon rather than saying, rather than using old fashioned language like, I think I'm sad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I'm despairing. I think, I think the world is making me really sad. Mm -hmm. I think three years of COVID and Ukraine and this and that has made me sad rather than I have the mental disorder of depression yeah. Yeah. and a chemical and a chemical with powerful effects is going to do something for that. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear on that. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more. Again, you know, we really are heavily, heavily over medicated. Um, I'm very glad, actually, that conversation about so-called big pharma is, is coming more and more and more to the fore, you know, to a mainstream level. It's not just people who are critical thinkers who have been watching these really scary trends develop more and more over time. It's now risen to, it seems like, more of a level where, you know, the average person is starting to get concerned about medication. But then, you know, we have the whole thing about, is it maybe a little bit too late because it's become so integrated into our food, our air, our water, and how we treat mental illness rather than helping people address self-awareness. So I want to bring the, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Okay. Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I actually think it is probably too late because human beings seem to want to collude with the players because human beings seem to want that kind of answer. They want to be able to say, I have this rather than taking personal responsibility for what's going on. Agreed, yeah. I mean, we're, that's another thing. We're taught so thoroughly how to be victims, how to live in a, a, with a victim mentality. And we're not even aware, I think, of how much we do that and how much the systems we live in encourage us to do that. So I, yeah. I do hear you on that. And so let's bring it back around to you again, because you have um, directly relating to what you were just talking about. You, you sort of painted a picture of, um, I think an accurate picture of how most people blanket statement are living and feeling right now and what wellness or the approach towards wellness blanket statement again is generally mm -hmm. looking like and it's not healthy or helpful for us and we're seeing evidence of the results of that that are detrimental to us we see that evidence everywhere so bringing yeah. it back to you um you have a philosophy that you found incredibly helpful called curism and i'd really love i hope i'm pronouncing it properly I'd really yes. love to hear, thank you, what, what curism is, if you can explain that for our audience. Um, I, I would be very surprised if the large amount of our audience have already heard of it. I think it's something that is very little known. So it's a beautiful philosophy. It's very holistic. It has to do with wellness. And I would love it if you could share what you know and what you feel and think about it as well with our audience. Well, it's something that I created out of, let's say, whole cloth, comma, but also it has its roots in essentially existential thought, I would say. So it's it's a philosophy that I've put together mm -hmm. to try to make a coherent, contemporary, updated existentialism. Um, it can be found in a book of mine called Lighting the Way. That's where I spell it out. And the long story is I grew up I was born right after World War II, and I grew up in that ethos. And one of the metaphors of that, one of the realities of World War II, but also one of the metaphors of that time period was the idea of being a resistance fighter, which flowed right out of World War II, and the resistance fighters in World War II. And even as a young kid, I sort of saw, saw myself, I saw that as, the, the, as my actual occupation in life was to just dispute things that didn't make sense to me and act as a resistance fighter in life. Mm, I love that. And although I was a math and science boy and thought I would be a physicist type person and went to a math and science high school and all of that, none of that actually interested me, even though I was good at it and did it. What interested me was existential literature, which I was reading as a young kid. So I would be reading, I'd be doing vector calculus off to the left, but in front of me would be reading Camus and Sartre and what have you. And one, and Sartre wrote an essay, which was called something like, what is existentialism? And it ends with the following sort of worry or problem. And that is, where should existentialism go next? that kind of question, where should it go next? And rather than tackling that himself, he went off on a tangent and, and wrote a long biography of another author, Flaubert or Balzac, I can't remember. He didn't know where to go with it. And no one else to my mind had an idea of where to go with existentialism next. Mm -hmm. And so that was on my mind forever, for 70 years. Oh, wow since I was five or six or seven as where, where could existentialism go next? And so wow. I've been swirling around there and circling around there doing all kinds of things. Um, I wrote in this area 40 years ago, but not well yet. I didn't write well in this area yet because I didn't, I hadn't landed upon the core ideas that are now, that now make sense to me. And that are the core ideas of this philosophy I'm calling Kirism. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm calling it curism because in many languages that that prefix cure uh, refers to illumination. So that's sort of where the word comes from, curism. Oh, beautiful, that's beautiful. Um, and I hope to sell it more in the world over time and, and get it be better known, but, but circle back around. 
the things that I would the things that I could not have said 40 years ago that I can say now easily are things like the paradigm shift from the idea of life having a purpose to the idea of life purpose choices. These sound very simple to say, but they actually take a long time to figure out. And the next one was a big one, and that was the idea of a shift, another paradigm shift that I think we all have to make from seeking meaning to making meaning. And we've had the thousand year old metaphor of being a seeker of meaning that's out there. So the meaning's out there mm -hmm. on a mountaintop or at a guru's feet or in a book in the Bible is out there rather than what I think is the truth. And that is that meaning is a certain kind of psychological experience. It's a certain kind of subjective psychological experience like many other kinds of experiences. And therefore, this is a big headline. It's going to go in one ear and out the other, but it's actually big news. As a psychological experience, it naturally comes and goes, like all psychological experiences do. And therefore, we should be much less worried about meaning vanishing than we are. We need a new maturity around, oh, meaning's gone for a while. Doesn't matter. It will return. It's a renewable resource. Oh, I love that. People are struggling with meaning because they they misunderstand what it is. Oh, I love that. I love that. I really love that. Sorry to interrupt you. I just have to like explain because this is fantastic. Please keep going. It's just just that that they that without being able to articulate it, they think it's out there and that they've never found it, or it was like a lost wallet or lost car keys, that they misplaced meanings or something, rather than understanding that it's merely, merely a certain kind of psychological experience. And as such, it comes and goes. Mm. We can't manufacture it, but we can coax it into existence by doing X, Y, Z. And I can spell out X, Y, Z. It takes a while to spell it out, but there are things to do to bring meaning back when it has vanished. But that it is going to vanish is a given. Just as, would anybody say, I'm going to be joyous every moment of my life? Mm. <laughs> nice try, but no. Yes. Ain't, ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Yeah. Nor, am I gonna, nor am I going to be angry every minute. Or am I going to, I'm not going to be anything any minute, every minute. Nor am I going to have the experience of meaning. And the same thing. You read a book when you're 23, most meaningful thing you've ever read. Read it again at 44. What was interesting about that? <laughs> meaning shifts. Our experience of the same thing feels meaningful to us one time and not mean. And, the, and if you have 50 people in a lecture hall, give them their evaluation form, 25 will say, most meaningful lecture I ever attended, 25 will say, least meaningful, etc. Yeah, actually, you might be the right person for me to ask. There was somebody really <laughs> famous at one point who said, um, you know, something like 30 different people can read the same book. This is one of my favorite expressions. 30 different people can read exactly the same book, and it's 30 different books. Absolutely. And, you know? and, there's, the old, and there's the old joke about uh, put two Jews in a room and you get three opinions. As a Jew, yeah. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. Perspective is everything. Yes. Meaning is a subjective psychological experience. Once a person gets that, then you understand that living your life purposes is so much more important than worrying about meaning. Mm -hmm. Just let meaning go as an issue. It's going to come and go. And what's important is that you do those things that make you proud. If you experience meaning, take a simple example. Let's say some cause matters to you, and right, we're right, right in this Roe versus Wade moment with the Supreme Court, and no, 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 no. Let's say there's something that matters to you, and you and you decide to be in service of that or an activist in service of that cause, but your only job this week is to lick envelopes. That's that's the job assigned you. So you lick envelopes. You may not have one moment of the experience of meaningfulness that week licking envelopes. You may just be bored. But you know why you're doing it. You're doing it in the service of one of your life purposes. 
And therefore, that knowledge allows you to continue doing that work, even though you're bored or overwhelmed or whatever, whatever it is you're feeling doesn't matter if it's in the service of work that you believe is valuable. Mm. To give you another example, I, I use this all the time because it just strikes me as the way to say it. In the days before D-Day, as I say, World War II was important to me. In the days before D-Day, we don't care how Eisenhower is feeling. Doesn't matter if he's depressed or anxious or this or that. Mm. We just need him to get the invasion right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a great way of phrasing it. He's got a job there that matters to all of us. Now, what's interesting there is most of us don't think of our life as rising to the hard bar level of a D of D day. It's like we don't think that our life is that important that we ought that we ought to or need to take it seriously. We have we have to act like we matter. We have to act like our efforts matter. We don't really think we matter any longer. Can you we think we're, we we think we're just excited matter put together because the universe could do it. That's the postmodern perspective: is that we don't really matter. We can argue ourselves into the belief that we matter, but deep down, we kind of think we're just matter passing through the universe and why bother? So we have to keep reminding ourselves that while we're here, we're here. Right. And okay. What... Yeah, and of course there's a difference. I mean, what, you're, what you just said of the sort of general uh, approach to, to life mattering makes me think more of nihilism than existentialism, right? This sort of, well, what's the point of doing this or that because there's no meaning in it anyway, or, you know, my, I'm just a dot, I'm just a speck in the universe kind of thing. But there's another way, I find that that, that perspective can also be very expansive, right? Thinking of ourselves as being just a little grain of sand in the universe. We can see ourselves as a small part of a huge, a, a gigantic whole. Right, that, that we are part of. So are you are you seeing well, that? There's, there's that there's that way of saying it, but let me express it a little differently with a different um, metaphor. So at the turn of the last century, turn of the 19th century, the avant-garde artists, Picasso, Brock, those artists, believed that nobody would understand what they were doing. And so they had a phrase which was that they were after an audience of one. Mm. That is, if, if one other person understood what they were doing, they would be happy. Now, that wasn't true. They wouldn't be happy at all. They wanted <laughs> of a billion. They were your basic, you know, narcissistic, arrogant, grandiose artists. <laughs> and maybe especially but, Picasso, yeah. <laughs> maybe, especially, maybe especially Picasso. Uh, short person syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they still had that phrase and that actually still had meaning for them and it has meaning for us. That is, even if we, if you want to think about being part of the bigger universe or what have you, but this other way of looking at it, that is, if you can be of service to one other person, that matters. We don't have to minimize that somewhere in our being. We could maximize that. It's like a child, a mom holding her child's hand crossing the street. Mm -hmm. that might be the most meaningful thing that person does on that day and the richest thing yes and we I don't understand. need a global we don't need a global perspective for that it, if yeah. we could settle into the okayness of that moment and the okayness of the moment after that as mattering like okay now i'm going to watch my child not fall off the monkey bars mm -hmm. and now we're going to now we're going to go for the healthy snack and and now we're going to read a good book and it's one sort of right thing after another that matters definitely if, if only because it's keeping us in the present which of course keeps us connected you know to ourselves and what we're sensing feeling thinking in that moment and what other people around us are yes and to go back to the life purposes model if one of our life purposes is to be to say stay good parent is not a rich enough way to say it but to be that 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 deep to do that deep parenting, to be really be there for your child, which so many parents have trouble doing nowadays because it's a fractured life and everybody's running off in different directions. But to have that moment with your child 
is about being in the present moment, but but it just matters. It it matters long term yeah. for your memory banks. Now you have a memory of being with your child and for your child's life progress, life course. So it matters in many different ways. Yeah. Whether the universe cares or not about you and your child having a good moment, you can care. I guess, you know, in a way, we're almost talking about the same thing because, you know, if we picture that example, the mother and, uh, uh, holding the, hands, the child's hand and protecting them as they go across the street, yeah. that could be the so-called grain of sand that also has a cosmic place, you know, because, because that one moment, as you're saying, has such meaning in the moment, but also has this long lasting ripple effect. That child is having it modeled to them that that's how you care about, how, how a parent cares about their child, how they protect them. There's the physical touch, there's the care that comes with the physical touch, and they're going to learn that and pass it along to their own children. They can teach friends, children. I mean, there is a wide ranging um, ripple effect from every single action, yeah. <laughs> that's right, and we could sort of massage our various understandings of the butterfly effect or how, sure. <laughs> how, how things work. So yeah, that's right. Uh, we're probably there's probably probably a gulf remains between um, these belief systems, but but it's sometimes I think of these deep gulfs. I'm going off in a, in a direction, but let, let me just go yeah, off in go for it. a second. Go for it. Many times I have to um, help creativity coaching clients, creatives take risks because that's a lot of what the creative encounter is about taking one kind of risk or another, mm -hmm. going into the darkness, dealing with creative anxiety, one kind of risk. So I'll have them visualize two mountains that are separated by an extremely deep gulf, but that can be just stepped over in one step. That is that the width between the two mountains is tiny, but the gulf is deep. If you're focusing on the depth of the gulf, gulf then you can't possibly cross because it's too scary. But if you're focusing on just taking one step, then you can easily get across. It's the same picture and both are true. Both are true. There is a deep gulf and a simple step and a single step. Yes, I hear that. I hear that. It's kind of like the Rumi quote, you know, that each one of us is the ocean in a single drop, that kind of thinking. Um, but you're also talking about perspective and you, you mentioned anxiety. I wanted to actually jump to that. You gave me the, per the perfect segue into that. Um, you've talked about how creatives cannot avoid anxiety and that anxiety and creativity are kind of hand in hand. And that's also an unusual perspective, right? Because touching again on this, this current time we're living in and how we're supposed to just medicate everything away and shop it away, be consumers and pretend we don't have feelings. Um, you know, we're not really looking at uh, the anxiety that many of us have to quite a high degree because of the fractured lives we live, you know, how externally distracted we are and how busy we are and stressed and all of that. So anxiety is largely seen as being a bad thing that we should avoid, right? But I've heard you talk about it. That's yeah, of course, of course, yes. But I've heard you talk about it in a more empowering way when you're talking about kind of what you were just saying about just being okay with the moment, right? I've heard you talk about just kind of being okay with being anxious as a creative and realizing the opportunities that anxiety gives you. Well, so I was wondering I, if you could talk about that. I, I'm interrupting you because I wouldn't say it that way about being okay with. It, it's rather understanding that it's coming and having anxiety management tools to deal with it. It's not like you want to sit there anxiously. It's not that right. you white knuckle the encounter. Yes. But, but it's coming. So let me start from the beginning, so to speak. And that is anxiety is a feature of our early warning system against danger. It's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to feel anxious. If entering an elevator with somebody who looks dangerous, we're, that's supposed to make us feel anxious. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to not enter that elevator. Mm -hmm. we're, we're supposed to have an early warning system that works. So anxiety is not the enemy, we need it because it's part of that early warning system against danger. The system doesn't work very well and we get too anxious for small reasons. 
when things aren't actually dangerous, they nevertheless can feel dangerous or be received as dangerous. And then we get anxious for no good reason. Mm. And there was no, we get anxious when there was no danger. So that's something to get clearer on as a creative or as a human being is that we naturally get too anxious for not good enough reasons too often. For creatives, there's a special picture here. Apart from all the other reasons why the creative act might provoke anxiety, including that eventually you expect it's going to be seen and therefore it might be criticized or rejected or all of that stuff, or anxious because it's hard work to do and you may mess it up and, and end up with having spent six months on something that doesn't work and that doesn't feel good. There are many, many, many reasons why one might feel anxious doing creative work, but there's a primary reason. And most creatives don't know this. And that is that the creative act is making one choice after another. That's what the creative act is. Put the comma in, take the comma out. Put a little red here, or should it be blue? Should my character go to Zanzibar or Paris? One decision and choice after another and choosing provokes anxiety by its very nature. Mm. Having to make choices, whether it's, do I want the good tasting cereal or the good for me cereal, or should I buy a Toyota or a, this car? Or Every kind of choice provokes anxiety naturally. And the creative act is an infinite number of choices. Ah, uh, that makes so much sense. Once you get why it, why it feels the way it feels and you go, oh, wow, anxiety is going to thread through this. So I need some anxiety management tools to help me get to the encounter and deal with the encounter. And all I may need is something as simple as I'm okay. I may just need a cognition. Like, wow, a lot of choosing going on today. I'm okay. Yes, yes. You may just be linguistic, or you may need something somatic, or you may need a ceremony or a ritual where you light a candle and say, I'm going into the encounter now, and I know, I know I'm going to be anxious, but I'm, I'm going there. What do most people do with regard to anxiety? They flee the encounter. They leave. Yes. That's why I just saw a number the other day. I don't know if it's a real statistic, but 97% of writers don't finish the book they started. Oh my goodness. Wow, I wouldn't have thought it was that high. But I yeah. thought it was 99% because people flee the encounter of things. They don't, these writers do not know that they're not writing their novel or not finishing their novel because they're anxious. They, they don't make that connection. They say other things. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, there's a plot hole. I don't have time. I'm tired. 20 things that can be said different from my book makes me a little anxious. Mm. So how do you think that people, because I, I agree with you, you know, we, we are definitely um, needing to sort of just generally be more present with ourselves in order to recognize things like that and be able to coach ourselves through them. So considering that you are in a position now where you are coaching people through yep creativity through anxiety, what is some advice that you could give our audience that they can use? Because um, the new thing seems to be, you know, nobody has any time. So well, there, they're very there, short there, sure, there are lots of things to do um, tactically. L let's just run through a few. One is to, and I have a whole book on this called Redesign Your Mind. One is to visualize your mind as a room and redesign it and redecorate it. Oh, I like that. So that rather than always trying to think different thoughts, now you change the source of the thoughts. And so there are many things you would do to redesign your mind. One would be to install windows so a breeze blows through, so you stop thinking of those same stuffy ideas that we keep thinking. So install some windows. Get rid of that bed of nails that we're on. People pestering themselves and replace that bed of nails with an easy chair. That'd be nicer. Mm. And in line with what we're talking about, add a calmness switch to your room so that when you enter, you flip the calmness switch and you just have a calm experience. So there's a way to think about your mind and your relationship to your mind that is different from the customary way that 
cognitive behavioral therapy thinks about it, which is to change maladaptive thought and to kind of arm wrestle every thought to the ground and to provide thought substitutes for thoughts that aren't working. All of that's interesting and a lot of that's useful, but this is a different idea, changing the source of those thoughts by actually redesigning your mind. So that is a kind of thing that I would sell to a client, that idea of let's take a little time and just picturing how that might be. Another, in line with this, what's often needed for a client to do their creative work is to do that thing we talked about earlier, take a certain kind of risk and stop censoring themselves to themselves. So I would invite them in the same redesign your mind way to install a speaker's corner in their mind. You may be, re remember that there was a speaker's corner in Hyde Park in London where for hundreds of years, yes, folks could say anything without fear of reprisal. That very idea of saying something without fear of reprisal is not available to a lot of people. They fear reprisal. So installing a speaker's corner in your own mind where at least in that part of your brain for a certain portion of the day, you can go there and say anything without fear of reprisal. That might be the linchpin. That might be the thing that allows you to reduce your experience of anxiety and come to the work calmly. And I have lots of other tactics. I have this one that most people don't like because you'll see why they don't like it in a moment. But and that's, <laughs> that's the idea of taking to your workspace, a cup, a spoon and an egg, a raw egg, and cracking it. Because I have discovered over the years that that visceral experience of cracking an egg is like cracking through resistance. Huh. So if you're resistant to doing your, but most people don't like cracking an egg for no reason. They're squeamish. <laughs> So they, so they find their other way of massaging that exercise and have it not be about an egg, but about something else, tea and stirring it. But I like the, the egg cracking energy, except you yes. don't like egg in this model. But there are lots of things to try. And I have tactics and strategies in all of my books. I have a book called Mastering Creative Anxiety, in which I think I have 20 categories of anxiety management tools, somatic things to do, ceremonial things to do, cognitive things to do etc. So there are plenty of things to try. Folks don't typically try them. Yes. Folks don't typically own for real one or two anxiety management strategies that really work for them. They may drink scotch or, you know, take Valium. They may have anxiety management tools that we're not selling here, not good, not effective ones, not healthy ones. They may do things to reduce their anxiety that they wish they didn't do, but most people don't have things that work and that are portable. It's important that your anxiety management strategy go with you because let's say you have a great meditation practice and you're perfectly calm for 20 minutes first thing in the morning. That's wonderful. But if that's not portable, if that doesn't help you reduce your anxiety when you're about to speak to a literary agent, then that really hasn't served you in the ways in which you need an anxiety management tool to serve you. It needs to be there when you need it. Yes. So considering your background in psychology, I want to I want to grab the opportunity to discuss a little bit what you just said, because it is true. You know, everyone is looking for solutions to feel better because we have this, we've been so ingrained with this idea that we have to be happy, right? And we're not accepting of the fact that happiness, at least in this dimension or whatever you want to call it, uh, prob perfect happiness just does not exist and that the human condition is very complicated and that's just the way it is. We have to kind of utilize what we can to empower no, ourselves. I, no, I know I'm interrupting, but, but I want to say it, it not only does it not exist, it's the wrong goal. Because mm -hmm. it, it, it does, that isn't what makes us, oh, I'm a happy person. That isn't what makes us proud. Doing the right things makes us proud. So happiness isn't, shouldn't even be a goal. Agreed. It's more like satisfaction, contentment, meeting, meaning, yes. being in the present. Yeah. yeah. And we're yes. always going to have struggles. We're always going to have fears and anxieties and all of that. That is part of life. And so that is, again, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because you have an empowering perspective about that. So I want to talk about the fact that, you know, you and so many other people have put out beautiful content that is very supportive, right? That, that are tools that work. These are methods that work, the things you were just outlining that you tell your clients, for mm -hmm. example, but people aren't using them. 
And we could say, oh, you know, it's because we don't have too much, we have too much time, we don't have enough time, we're too busy, we have children, we have, you know, we have jobs, we have this and that. Um, but the fact is that time is manipulatable, right? We can use time the way that we really would yeah. like to, we just don't always know how to. So what do you think is the reason why there is this weird juxtaposition of so many people looking for wellness, looking for happiness, you know, joining Instagram groups that are all about wellness, but they can't actually integrate these strategies that work into their lives. Well, what is that about? That is, it's, that work is, work is work. I think it's that simple. That is, folks are doing work for pay that they must do, whether they want to do it or not. So that takes 60 hours of their week. Then mm -hmm. they want to be soothed and they want to spend 20 hours on the latest TV series that amuses them. And that's, that's life. So it's social media and TV and this, that, soothing things, mm -hmm. distracting things, and necessary things. And that's why I said, if you, if you do not organize your day around your life purposes, you will not get to them. So if one of your life purposes now is to be a calmer person, because a life purpose doesn't have to be a doing thing, like increase your career, it can be a being thing, like mm -hmm. being a calmer person, that can be a life purpose choice. Oh, I like that a lot. That's a beautiful way of phrasing it. Please go on. Then you have to, my language for this is you have to negotiate each day around your life purposes, not around your to-do list. And what that means is you need to create pockets for the five or six or seven things you believe are important. There might be a relationship pocket, 45 minutes of being with your child in a very present way and 45 minutes of working on your novel and 45 minutes of working on your uh, anxiety management strategy, learning, I have a whole book called 10 Zen Seconds, learning some what I call incantations and practicing them. But all of that's very regimented and routinized and mm -hmm. forces you to live a certain kind of life which from the outside sounds boring or strict or something. It's the only way to live though, to get to your life purposes, yeah. the only way. Yeah, it does require a bit of structure and discipline. And it's, it's funny, you know, I was talking to somebody who, um, so I have this resistance to exercise, you know, yeah. I, I love moving, I love being out in nature, love going for hikes, love all of that. But I, I hate going to the gym. I'm just not a gym yep. person, you know, and, and the whole concept of exercise just feels like another chore or task or something else that I have to add to my to do list. So I was talking to this person about it and um, how I could shift my mindset about it. And she said, well, you make doctor's appointments, don't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, or appointments for your glasses or appointments, I'm deaf, right? So appointments for my cochlear implants. And I said, yes. And she said, well, when those appointments arrive, do you just decide not to go? And I said, no, I go. And she's like, well, why can't you make appointments for yourself and show up to them, yeah. right? Make appointments to exercise and show up to them. But we're just not really used to thinking like that. We're not used yeah. to thinking and about- those, how those are the tactics that coaches sell to clients. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, slip in a side note because you used a word that scares people and, and actually disempowers them, I think. Not that you were saying it that way, but it's the discipline word. I don't think it's a lack of discipline because people get up and go to their jobs. They, they do discipline things all day long. Yes. It's, a, it's a lack of devotion. Mm. Pavarotti has a quote I love, which is people say I'm disciplined, but it's not discipline, it's devotion. And there's a big difference. Would you and say that that's the same as commitment? No, I think devotion comes from a place, discipline comes from that strict energy place Mm -hmm. Devotion comes from a place of love. Okay. And self-love in this case. That is actually loving oneself, lo wanting the best for oneself, wanting to do those things that are part of that dream vision of what a good life looks like. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, it's, it's not a lack of discipline. It's a lack of love. Oh, a lack of self-care, love for self. Would you say that? It's a lack of love for self. Okay, so let's go with that because this is one of my favorite topics is talking about love mm -hmm. and care for self and also um, 
you know, we're, we're kind of, we're at with that in this society, in this culture. When I say this, I'm really focusing on North America, not to exclude the rest of the world. You know, we have some listeners in Australia and other countries, um, but just because this is what's familiar to me and this is what's familiar to you. So we'll just use this as, an, as a little example. Um, North America is really, really heavily uh, built on consumerism, right? And that's incredibly distracting for us. We're always looking for what we should be buying or what we should be doing. We have all these different things around us that are, as you mentioned earlier, seductive, distracting, and take us away from ourselves. So during the pandemic, we're seeing lots of people um, start to revisit this topic of what is meaningful to me? What is my life really for? What am I doing? You know, how am I using my time? What is actually important to me? People are leaving cities and moving out to countryside, right? Buying homes in nature, this kind of thing. So as part of that, and, and people are talking more about how they feel, right? They feel what's going on in the world today. And you started talking about energy, that the word discipline and the word devotion have automatically a different feeling. I mean, I can feel it when I say those words, I feel the difference of discipline and the difference of devotion. So if we sort of get a little esoteric here and a little bit abstract, which fortunately you're used to because you're into the creativity thing, how does energy take place in people's decision makings, like in people's decision making, their choices when it comes to what they're choosing for themselves or what's happening in their lives? How do you think energy comes into it? It's a great question. So we're born with energy, with chi. We have life energy. I don't think we all have the same amount. I think some people are born with more life energy than other people. They're going to be our artists and inventors and what have you. They're stuck with more energy, so to speak, burdened mm -hmm. with extra energy. It's going to play out as ADHD at seven oh, and okay. it, kids bouncing off walls. With, I can't tell you how, how many kilowatts of energy our grandkids have. In, in, implausible amount of energy. If they could not get out and run around, they would destroy the world. <laughs> so we have this energy and two things happen. Well, three things happen, but the third is unlikely. Namely, we do a good job. We do a good job of dealing with it. That's, that's three. One is we don't do a good job of dealing with it and we run a bit amok energy wise. And we end up with things with names like mania. Mm -hmm. We send our brain racing. Wow, it's going to race. And then if we're not a good brakeman or good brake woman, it, it's going to race off to unproductive obsessions and all kinds of places that don't serve us. So there's a whole thing to be talked about, about what mania is and how that connects to un unmodulated energy, energy going off, off the tracks so to speak. And then, and this is what most people do, they suppress their energy. They, they damp it down. And so they live like semi-zombies. They look fine. They look Stepfordish. You know, they say hello and all of that, but they don't really have a way of releasing that energy because it feels either dangerous or verboten in some way. And so they, 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 they're scared of their own energy. And so they keep it repressed kind of forever sometimes. Lots of people. And in this culture of ours that doesn't love energy, that, that wants us to go to that lowest common denominator, mm -hmm. speak to the person least able to hear rather than the person most able to hear kind of place, Energy is suppressed all over, damped down. And so most people who could be doing lots of excellent work aren't. Partly because the work is hard, and we've talked about that. It's just hard to write a novel, but partly because they're not in right relation to their own energy. It scares them to release that energy. Yes, yeah, so I was just thinking of that famous Marianne Williamson quote. It's, I think it was her. It's not our darkness that we're most afraid of. It's our light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I agree with and, that as well. And, you know, and kids, of course, receive so many reprimands and injunctions around, you know, energy around, you know, be quiet. Mm -hmm. Stop that. Stop that a million times a day. Stop that. Be quiet. Why are you doing that? Stop that. 
Yes. Rather than teaching them where to put their energy, what to do with it, how yeah. to express it. Yeah. Yes. And it's, and the, the average parent could, will have no conception of how to invite a child to do something that matches their basic high energy. Mm-hmm. And what is what do I mean by that? You can invite a, a young child, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old. I do this with my eight-year-old going on nine-year-old grandson. Ask, invite him to think about the biggest things like, you know, how would you make world peace happen? Oh, that's beautiful. You give them the biggest kind of question to think about. Right now, <laughs> as I told you, I'm interested in World War II. And so my grandson and I are, are looking at kind of the errors made by both sides that sort of the butterfly effect things, the little things like one little plane leaving too late, which allowed for the Battle of Midway to be won by the Allies, etc. So we're just looking at the connections between little things and big things. Mm-hmm. And he's got a grasp on this that God help us. He, I hope he doesn't lose as he, as school infects him year by year. But right now at the age of eight, he could think anything. Yeah, I mean, we, you and I were talking earlier about children at the beginning of our conversation. And I, I fully support that. You know, I had, I'm lucky. I had two parents who, of course, we're not perfect. No parents are, but uh, they, they gave me a wonderful gift of, especially my father, of, of making me think abstractly. So there was this one, I think I was eight or nine, and I was eating with my father at the table, which is the two of us. And he said to me, what if the earth, this is right in line with what you asked your grandson. He said, what if the earth was an apple? that was falling from a tree that was in an apple, that was falling from a tree that was in an apple, that was falling from a tree. And my little brain just went, you know, I've never forgotten that moment. I've never forgotten when he asked me that question. So he's very good at asking me abstract questions like that. And it definitely, I recognize that it helped to, it helped me to, uh, to train myself to think that way, right? To question. So when I think I was going to school and my wife was teaching, and we had two little girls at that moment. So my mom would watch them. Let's say they were four and six, that kind of age. My mom would come over and, and watch them kind of all day long. And she didn't do a lot of, she didn't do really physical things with them. She didn't take them to the park so much, but she played games with them, but they were intellectual games. And they were, her favorite game was court. So there'll be little Johnny. So little Johnny has done something And the girls would have to decide what was a fair punishment given all of the circumstances for little (laughs) little Johnny. Oh my gosh. Misdemeanor. (laughs) It was all about justice training or or (laughs) refined thinking around what's what's the right (laughs) punishment for an infraction. Oh boy. So so interesting. And they loved it. They loved it. Well, no, little Johnny shouldn't be treated that harshly. Mm, so debate, <laughs> debate, debate and kind of like collaborative problem solving. Yep. And yeah, mm-hmm. that's wonderful. That's wonderful. We don't have as much of that anymore. That is for sure. I mean, even the art of debate, you know, it's, it, you can't even go there with people sometimes because we, we've really the not lost, but I've seen, you know, yeah, there's a decline in um, the art of conversation, you know, and debate includes that as well. So bringing it back to children, um, you work with young people and you work with their parents. And I've also worked with young people. We both have a shared view that children are extremely important and that perhaps we're not giving them as much um, credit as they are due because we see them as being unformed, right? But really all of us are unformed. None of us ever fully arrive in our full beingness, right? So it's a little bit of an inaccurate thing to say about kids. But just going back to what you were saying, you know, asking children really big questions and giving them the opportunity to think about these things. My experience has been, and it sounds like yours has, as well, yours has been as well, that they, they rise to meet that challenge. You know, they want to be asked these questions. They love playing with these different possibilities and options and using their critical thinking, their imagination, their curiosity, the things we were mentioning before. So what do you think that we need to change or alter or shift or reframe in terms of how we see children in our society and their place, their role in our lives? Well, first we need to be a new species, a better species, but since we can't 
snap our fingers and do that one. We'll have to live with the species we are. So first of all, the mental disorder labeling thing is on so many people's minds yeah. that it's very hard to not see um, a child being energetic as a symptom of ADHD or a child saying no as a, as a symptom of ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, et cetera. To, as for parents themselves to not begin to see their kids' behaviors and thought patterns as symptoms of mental, that they're now looking for, is my child on the spectrum? Or yeah. worry, worrying about being like a detect, all day long being a detective, like is my, is my child manifesting this symptom or that symptom? and heading kind of inexorably towards the label pill thing. Where so, so there's that. Tr as a parent, try not to do that. Try not to see your child as a symptom picture, but try to let go of that because that's a manufactured way of looking at your child. So that's A, treat him as an equal, treat her as an equal. Not in terms of responsibilities, she can't start ironing at the age of five, but in terms of intellectual matters, just speak as if she were an equal, yeah. rather than speaking down. And as, as we're both agreeing, children will, will love that and will rise to that occasion. I remember being very young, let's say six or seven, my mom would um, employ me as the problem solver for her friends, for her friends' problems. She'd go like, you know, um, Miriam and her husband um, have, are having this problem. He, he wants the window open because he likes a breeze and she finds it uh, too cold and she wants the windows closed and she doesn't like the bugs coming in. What would you do? And I'd say, screens, get a screen. Oh. And you can a nice middle path answer. <laughs> she must have been like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Of course. Green. So, so just pr pr just talk to a child like that. You know, mm. here's, what's, here's what's going on, um, etc. So try to avoid that de detectivizing around mental disorders. Treat your child as an equal. Probably get bigger yourself. Right, if you're a squashed person, <laughs> you probably have to do your own work to be your creative self or your, you know, that person. Yeah. Be that bigger, better, more righteous person. That that will help. So much of the difficulty in writing for parents is that we're kind of not allowed to point a finger at parents. It, it's as if nothing the parent is doing is part of the problem. But of course, what parents do will very often be part of the problem or the whole problem. Also, just notice what's going on. And it sounds ridiculous to say, but notice what's going on. If for practical reasons, you now have to move two of your children into the same room when they used to have separate rooms, stuff's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen? There's not going to be some new fighting or someone's not going to wet the bed or nothing's going to happen from squashing them into one room suddenly. It would be a kind of blindness dash, not being presentness dash something to not imagine that something isn't going to happen from that set of circumstances. Notice just uh, in Kirism, we have an idea of, st of the step to the side, which is just a, a phrase for maintaining awareness rather just sort of moving through life this way, sometimes we have to step to the side and see what's going on. Yeah, the so objective let's say, perspective, right? It's like the objective perspective. You step outside yourself and observe yourself in this situation or observe the situation outside of your own mind. Yeah, that's that right. a lot of sense. So if your child comes home from school sad and hungry, it should cross your mind what's going on. I packed him a big lunch. Why is he hungry and why is he sad? And your next thought should be, gee, I wonder if there's a bully who took his lunch and is making him sad. Mm. If, if, if you're not going to notice that he's hungry and sad, well, kids are hungry, so you're going to have trouble noticing that he's hungry because they're <laughs> always starving. But if it's, a different kind of, <laughs> if it's a different kind of starving, if there's some qualitative difference there, you know, between his normal starving self and something else, 
Yes. And, and sadness. In other words, notice what's going on. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. It does seem silly to even have to say that, but we've, we've just spent quite a bit of time talking about how we're living in a, a culture or society and a time that encourages us to be disconnected. Yep. Right. So of course, you know, our observation skills, which take subtlety and take presence of mind, yep. Yep. we need to be able to be in an observant state to even do that to begin with. And you can't, you have a much harder time doing that when you're feeling disconnected. And also our communication, you know, our, the sophistication of our communication, the cooperation of our communication, the strategy of our communication is just not the same anymore. And so, you know, you, the second part, I guess, would have to be that you have to be able to talk your child through yep. sharing a room with his brother. And you have to have, a you know, a certain emotional awareness of that, which first has to exist in yourself. You have to have that emotional dialogue and that self-dialogue with yourself first, which it's also hard to do when you're disconnected, right? So there's so many challenges you to, right now. You have, to, you, have to, you have to do a decent job of understanding your own agenda. Yes. And trying not to come with an agenda for my creative peeps very often their parents came with one or the other of two different opposing agendas one is the agenda of i never made it as a violinist you are going to make it as a violinist you're going to have so many lessons you're going to be the best mm -hmm. that agenda or the opposing agenda of, I never made it a viol as a violinist, you can't either. Nobody can make it. We're doomed to not do good work. We're, we don't, you don't have a chance. And parents come with these kinds of agendas, the you don't have a chance agenda, or the you're gonna make it agenda. And there are pieces of all of that that we understand and, and why they might get communicated as reality testing in a certain way but not as an unconscious agenda where you're just pushing the child or preventing the child, one or the other. Mm -hmm. We have to be cleaner in our interactions with our kids and not be coming from those kinds of places in our interactions. Understood. And of course, we have to be there for ourselves first before we can really do that. So because we're winding up with our time, I thought that that would be a wonderful place to leave, um, to leave this conversation is if you could leave our audience with uh, maybe they don't, it has to, doesn't have to be for parents. It could be for, for anyone who is looking for a deeper connection with themselves. Would you say that charism is a great way to do that? Creativity is a great way to do that? How can people find you, your information, your resources, and your suggestions? Yeah, well, there, there are many kinds of things to say. And of course, I would invite people to go learn about charism and lighting the way. But I think as a last thing, I would want to sell the idea of daily practice. That is, if there's anything that you, if you want to be in better touch with your life purposes, A, identifying them and B, living them, then the idea of daily practice becomes a really important one. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest a book of mine that came out last year called The Power of Daily Practice, which describes the elements of practice and sort of what it means to really maintain a daily practice because... If you try to do some high bar thing like write a novel, if you start to skip three or four days, you, you, you will discover that a year has just vanished. That when we don't do the things that we intend to do, then we don't do them for a long time. Mm -hmm. And one of the only antidotes to that problem is maintaining a daily practice, maintaining contact with the things that are important to us. So just as a last thing of the many kinds of last things one might say, I would say, getting in touch with the, with the idea and the reality of daily practice mm -hmm. might be valuable. In whatever way it looks, it looks for you. Yes, I love that. And consistency is incredibly important for integration of anything. So thank you. That's a terrific message. And Eric, Dr. Maisel, we have, I've so appreciated you being here today. I know Jenna does too. And uh, she would be here if she could. But I'm, I'm really grateful for you being here and sharing so many um, empowering thoughts and perspectives with people who are listening, who want to integrate more meaning, I guess, into their lives and to be able to look at it and understand it in a different way. Because I think, you know, our search of, towards meaning, you were alluding towards this, it gives us one more thing to be stressed about, right? That's how we sort of 
taken it on, but you're addressing it in a different way. And I really love that. And I really want our audience to have some exposure to that philosophy and that framework. So thank you for bringing that to the table and for your presence today. It really means a lot. Thanks so much for having me. It's great, great, great being here. Wonderful. Well, we'd we'll love to have you back. You know, maybe we can convince your wife to hang out in the background and yell her thoughts <laughs> from the chair in the corner. <laughs> She's shy. <Yeah. laughs> well, thank you so much, Eric, and we will see you again. Take good care of yourself. Okay. Bye for now. <laughs>